in the state's 46th district. Democrat Loretta Sanchez defeated nine-term Republican Congressman Robert Dornan by less than 1,000 votes. Congressman Vernon Ehlers of Michigan chaired Wednesday's meeting. The meeting will come to order. I will note that there is a quorum present. We're very pleased that all the members of this task force on judging the election in California 46th District are now appointed and we were able to have our first official meeting. I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague on my right, Mr. Ney from Ohio, and the Democrat appointed to the committee is Mr. Hoyer from Maryland. And I welcome you both. I think uh, we have a good group who can very diligently and honestly pursue the issues before us. The purpose of this task force is to review the election which has been contested in the 46th District of California. I would remind everyone that uh, the powers given the House Oversight Committee and indeed the House itself are articulated in the Constitution of the United States, Article 1, Section 5. Each House shall be the judge of the elections, returns, and qualifications of its own members. It's a very serious, very weighty responsibility that we bear in the House of Representatives, which by statute has been delegated to the Committee on House Oversight and through the action of the Chairman on the Committee on House Oversight has been delegated to this task, task force. There have been a number of elections numbering uh, less than 100, but approaching 100 over the history of this Congress. The Congress as a whole has acted very carefully, very honestly, very intelligently on each of those contested elections. This is a very serious responsibility which has been bestowed upon this task force. One that I intend to have the task force discharge as honorably as possible. I take this responsibility very seriously and I'm sure my colleagues on this task force do also. Every citizen in this nation has the right to have their vote recorded and counted accurately. They also have the right to expect that all the votes cast in an election will be tallied and counted accurately and that steps will be taken to prevent any illegalities, fraud, etc. It seems the issues before us are as follows. Were there any voting irregularities in this election? Was there fraud? Were there double votes, as has been alleged? Were there illegal voters? Was there any miscounting of the ballots? Was there any maladministration of the election? And the second major issue, depending on the answer to the first, if in fact there were any of the above, did they affect the results of the election? And so this is a double test that we must address in this task force, not simply a matter of looking at the legality or the illegality of various aspects of the election or mistakes, honest or otherwise. But after we have done that, and frankly I intend to do that very carefully to ensure the accuracy of the result, the second part of it is equally important, and that is whatever we may find, does that in fact have any effect on the election results? My approach as chairman is to be as thorough and as fair as possible, to be accurate in our, our analysis, to disregard the parties and the persons of the contestants involved in this election, to look at the election process as carefully, thoughtfully, and thoroughly as we can, and to make an honest determination in providing the answers to the two questions I've just outlined. I will point out the, the timelines involved. Uh, the Constitution does not specify that, but clearly it's in the best interest of the House to resolve these issues as quickly as possible. Uh, we acted as expeditiously as possible. As uh, some may know, there was a delay in appointing all the members of the Committee on House Oversight. And so the, other than the ranking member, uh, there, were, there was a delay in appointing the Democrat members. And so I delayed calling this meeting until not only had the Democrat members been appointed to the committee itself, but also to the task force. Furthermore, there was an additional delay I had previously set a meeting of this task force two weeks from yesterday, I'm sorry, two weeks ago from yesterday. 
and at the request of Mr. Hoyer, and I was certainly very happy to honor that request due to the, the very tragic death of his spouse, uh, the meeting was delayed until today. During that time, we had heard, first of all, from Mr. Dornan, who was contesting the re result of the election, and his request sub was submitted in a timely fashion. The response was also sub submitted in a timely fashion by Congresswoman Dorn uh, pardon me, Sanchez. I had hoped we could have the meeting earlier, but in fact, uh, as I mentioned, it had been delayed. In their intervening time, between the time I set the original meeting, which was for the purpose of considering the motion submitted by Ms. Sanchez, and the time of this meeting, we have also received a further letter from Ms. Sanchez, and that also is uh, a matter of record for this committee. So we will consider both documents in the course of this meeting. But I do want to assure my colleagues and the public, and particularly the gentleman from Maryland, that it is my intent to be as honest and honorable and fair as possible in the proceedings of this task force. Having said that, I'm pleased to recognize the gentleman from Maryland for his opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to say that uh, it is my expectation, having worked with you in the past, that you will, in fact, carry out, as you have expressed, uh, your duties as chairman of this task force with the fairness, uh, impartiality, uh, and consideration to both sides that the uh, gravity of the question before the committee uh, requires. This task force, as you have pointed out, convenes today to consider one of the most serious questions that come before the House of Representatives. It is a constitutional responsibility that we exercise. The people of the 46th District have exercised their most important right and responsibility in a democracy, electing their representative. It is now our responsibility that we undertake any questions of that outcome in the most responsible and fair manner. I'm hopeful and believe that the members of this task force will be approaching this task in that fashion. The Federal Contested Elections Act and the House precedents clearly, in my opinion, lay out the standard and procedures that govern our deliberations. Congresswoman Sanchez was declared the winner of the election after an official canvas overseen by representatives of Congresswoman Sanchez and Mr. Dornan and representatives of this committee, completed by the Orange County Registrar of Voters, Rosalind Lever, on December 9th. Congresswoman Sanchez was issued a certificate of election by the California Secretary of State, Bill Jones. Mr. Dornan, as has been pointed out by the chairman, requested an official re recount, and after that recount, he declined, as I understand it, to pursue existing California law remedies and filed a notice of election contest for the House of Representatives. In response to that motion, Congresswoman Sanchez filed a motion to dismiss pursuant to the Federal Contested Election Act, or in the alternative, a motion for a more definite statement. I believe today, Mr. Chairman, having reviewed the motion uh, and having reviewed the pleadings filed by Mr. Dorman, that, would, that it would be appropriate at this juncture to grant the motion to dismiss, and that Mr. Dornan has not in the words of the Tunno decision, which was a unanimous one by this committee, sustaining a Republican's uh, election to the Congress of the United States and dismissing the Democratic challenger's contest of that election. And it was dismissed on the grounds that uh, the Democratic contestant had not supplied sufficient allegations of evidence to justify his claim to the seat in order to overcome the motion to dismiss. Mr. Chairman, as the Democrat who was the minority member when we considered the Gadenson case, I took the opportunity to read all of the precedents, all of the precedents under the Federal Contested Election Act. Up until 1995, they were consistent in setting a standard which was a very high one indeed. 
because, as the Congress had stated on numerous occasions before and after the Federal Contested Election Act was passed, the Congress has historically given great weight to the elective process in the states and to the determination of the states of the results of that outcome. More recently, under the present uh, party's control, in 1995, the majority made clear that evidence offered by the contestant, and I quote now, must make credible, credible allegations. The committee goes on to say, the key word is credible. A contestant must provide specific, credible allegations to overcome the motion to dismiss. That is credible evidence that, it, if true, would likely change the result of the election. Mr. Chairman, you have mentioned both criteria. You listed a number of things which, unfortunately, uh, in light of the fact that most of America's elections are run in many instances by volunteers, uh, not so much in the central offices, but in the precincts uh, at the voting machines. They may get paid for that day, but none sufficiently, as I'm sure is the case in Michigan as it is in Maryland, by volunteers. There clearly are, almost in every election, irregularities, mistakes, yes, sometimes even fraud, uh, voters uh, voting who should not vote, miscounts, all of that occurs in almost every election. One of the great things about America is probably that it occurs so, uh, in such a small percentage of the overall voting pattern throughout this country. The key, however, has always been, and I think remains today, as you have said, not whether such irregularities or mistakes might have occurred inevitable, I suggest, in an election uh, of this magnitude, but whether or not they made a difference in the result. That is to say, but for those mistakes, the contestant would have won the election, not the contestee. The reason the statute and the committee itself has set such a high standard is obvious, Mr. Chairman. The questioning of the will of the people of the 46th District or any other district is a very serious one, and the committee should not become, and in my opinion, the committee does not want to become, and the committee should not become a forum either for frivolous challenges or for fishing expeditions. In this instance, Mr. Chairman, I do not believe that contestant Dornan has met the challenges that he, and that he has failed to state grounds sufficient to change the result of the election. Furthermore, unlike other cases that have come before this committee and in which I have been very involved, Mr. Dornan failed to exhaust or even to avail himself of state law remedies. While that is not necessary under the statute, it is clearly preferred by precedent. I strongly believe that Mr. Dornan has failed to meet the required standards. While he has made numerous allegations, there is not, in my opinion, sufficient evidence in support of these allegations. And most importantly, Mr. Chairman, I do not believe that there are credible allegations that would lead to a different outcome than the 979 vote margin of victory by which Mrs. Sanchez was elected the Congresswoman from the 46th District. Mr. Chairman, I would hope that this matter could be resolved today. Although I would note uh, that in the notice of meeting, it does not appear that we're going to dispose of, of anything today. I'm not sure that that's the case, but it, it, it's not on the agenda. But any anyway, if, however, the motion to dismiss cannot be resolved today, which would, if done, be consistent with almost every one of the precedents in these contested cases. That is not to be the case. 
I would like to clearly state at the outset of today's meeting that I expect the task force will be proceeding in an even-handed manner and that one party will not be procedurally disadvantaged over another. As I said, Mr. Chairman, from having worked with you, uh, that is my expectation because that has been uh, your performance in the past and I do not expect any deviation from that and I have no reason to. As I said at the outset, before us today is the most serious of issues that can come before the Congress. It is not an issue of party. It is not an issue of person. It is an issue of constitutional magnitude that the people of the 46th District, having voted, the State of California through its Secretary of State having certified the propriety of that election, will, unless there are extraordinary circumstances, have that vote and determination sustained by this committee. It is only with great trepidation, proof, and reason that members should question the democratic expression of American voters. Failing to meet that very high, appropriately very high standard, this matter should end today. Mr. Chairman, uh, as a preliminary matter, without having concluded my statement, uh, I noticed that uh, Mr. Schweitzer, counsel for the committee, is seated at the table. Uh, Mr. Gadenson has, uh, on behalf of the minority, uh, retained and asked to give his advice and counsel as well in this matter. Minority counsel, uh, Roger Ballantyne uh, from Patton Boggs. And I would ask Mr. Chairman if he might sit at the counsel table with Mr. Schweitzer so that we could have the advantage of, their, of, of the advice of both the majority counsel as well as the minority counsel on this important issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hoyer, for that statement. In response to your question, uh, we will deal with that uh, as soon as we complete the opening statements and hear the presentation of the Majority Council. Mr. Uh, Ney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I'll be brief yeah. on uh, my opening statement. Uh, let me just say that there are some things that uh, my colleague, uh, Congressman Hoyer, has stated that I can uh, fully agree with. This should not be about personalities or philosophies. This is about the facts and fair elections and taking a, uh, a look at uh, the election process. Uh, the one thing I would uh, point out uh, when we want to talk about the fairness of the House, uh, when it was noted that uh, a certificate of election was given to Congresswoman Sanchez by the state of California, and I would note we've already acted in fairness in the sense of seating her because obviously in the, in the McIntyre case, a certificate of election was given by Indiana, but he wasn't seated. So we have retained, I think, the honor of the House by seating in the first place Congresswoman uh, Sanchez. And uh, the purpose of this committee is to uh, look obviously at what Mr. Dornan has stated. However, I don't uh, fully believe that uh, we should completely debate here, has he alleged enough as much as uh, do we need to proceed further to receive additional information. Uh, there are some things in this case, and I was on the Gageson case uh, a couple of years ago. There are some things that are, are a little bit different in this in the sense of, as I understand it, two independent investigations that are uh, being pursued in California. And uh, also, according to the Los Angeles Times, in interviews, 19 acknowledgments that uh, uh, some people had not met uh, naturalization requirements uh, and had voted. Uh, that's 19. Are there more? Uh, you know, I don't know Are there, uh, what the situation is out there. But there are some uh, situations in this that just by at least media reports and information that has come in, it makes you, you look at it and, and wonder what uh, the whole situation is in the election. However, uh, I think our purpose, uh, again, is to uh, do this as accurately, as fairly as possible, but, but because of the fact of how uh, Congressman Dornan has written his statements, if he hasn't alleged enough, that may not necessarily be our task, but our task, again, may be to see how much more, in fact, we need to know. And also, I, I 
had a copy of a letter where uh, Congresswoman Sanchez herself, uh, I wish I had the letter in front of me, had stated something to the effect of uh, uh, coming to take a, a further look at this. So I just, uh, I, I think we've got to proceed with fairness, but I would just note that I think the House has in the sense of even though there were allegations made, we've proceeded to see Congresswoman Sanchez, and I hope that our uh, committee proceeds with fairness and, and accuracy, and, and I know it will uh, do the nature of the, of the people involved with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ney. The, um, I have a few comments to make before we turn to the Majority Council for presentation, and that is uh, to review a few items, but first to respond to the gentleman from Maryland in his uh, observations in which he recommends immediate dismissal of the case. It appears to me uh, that without any doubt this matter deserves further investigation. Uh, clearly, the newspaper accounts in which the Los Angeles Times and the Orange County Register have themselves gone out and identified some fraudulent votes. The fact that the District Attorney of Orange County, as well as the Secretary of State of the State of California, are conducting investigations of alleged irregularities in the election and, in fact, have uh, confiscated the, rec the records computer files and other information from an organization which is suspected of having given erroneous advice to voters in that district, and a number of other issues it, uh, certainly make it clear to me that we must proceed with further investigation of this. I believe this committee last session had a good record of dealing with the contested elections. I served on task, two task forces for two different elections. The one indeed did have frivolous charges and was dismissed quite quickly as a result. The other had more serious charges with some substantiation. Uh, we conducted a field hearing on it and after very careful work on it, a thorough investigation, decided that in fact the uh, alleged irregularities, if they had occurred, were not of sufficient magnitude to change the result of the election and so that was also dismissed. I believe this case, in fact I know this case, falls in the latter category. There are serious allegations. There is serious public concern that the votes were counted accurately and that the election result is accurate. I believe at the very least we must satisfy uh, the requirements of the public to know and be reassured that the election was either carried out accurately and the result is correct or in the alternative that there were mistakes made and that we uh, therefore have to review the implications of those mistakes. But I believe there is there's, uh, a motion to dismissal at this point would be totally out of order. I would point out in addition the letter I referred to a few moments ago which, which I received from Ms. Sanchez and it's dated February 12th and in fact uh, Mr. Ney referred to this and it might be well to simply read this into the record for those who are not yet aware of it or have not seen the text. Ms. Sanchez says, I am writing to advise the task force on the election contest in California's 42nd dist 46th district that I will be responding in detail prior to the hearing to be held the week of February 24th to the brief filed Monday with the clerk of the house by Mr. Dornan. Many of the spurious charges made by Mr. Dornan have been rebutted point by point by the Orange County Registrar and I want to be sure the task force is aware of this and other flaws in the Dornan brief prior to your meeting. As you know, I have made a motion to dismiss the challenge by Mr. Dornan because I am so convinced that a fair and thorough review of the election process in the 46th will verify the outcome certified by the Secretary of State. I will ask you to withhold consideration of my motion and invite the task force to conduct a field hearing in Orange County as soon as practicable. No credible evidence has been presented in more than three months since the election that even comes close to changing the outcome of the congressional election in the 46th. Not only has Mr. Dornan failed to find a sufficient number of questionable ballots, he has presented no evidence those ballots were cast in the congressional election, let alone any evidence those ballots were cast for any specific candidate. I believe that a fair hearing and regular order which receives testimony from all concerned parties will convincingly demonstrate to the task force that there is no credible evidence to cast doubt on the certified results of the November 6th election. 
I appreciate your cooperation. Very truly yours, Loretta Sanchez. Now, a couple of points I would make on this. First of all, she has, uh, in this letter, basically asks us to postpone action on the motion to dismiss the challenge by Mr. Dornan. Secondly, she uh, states that no credible evidence has presented, been presented. That certainly is open to debate, and it's up to this committee to find that out. Thirdly, she invites us to conduct a field hearing in Orange County, which personally I think is a very wise course of action and I think would be totally inappropriate to dismiss the case without conducting a field hearing. So I, uh, out of fairness uh, to the contestee, Ms. Sanchez, I think it's certainly appropriate, appropriate for us to uh, consider the course of action she outlines, namely uh, postponing action on the motion to dismiss and conducting a field hearing. I, uh, at this time, uh, would like to turn to our counsel, Mr. Schweitzer, and uh, first of all, ask him for any comments he might make, wish to make, some opening comments, and specifically his response to the letter uh, and to my comments that uh, it would be wise for the wise course for this task force to pursue to acquiesce in the action requested by the contestee in the letter. And in response to your earlier question, uh, in the sense of fairness, I will be happy, as soon as Mr. Schweitzer has, has completed his testimony, to welcome uh, your counsel to the table as well. Mr. Schweitzer. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, in response to your question, uh, the statute in Section 383D contemplates uh, the postponement uh, of the disposition of a, of a motion to dismiss until the hearing on the merits. And uh, my uh, recommendation to the task force, since Ms. Uh, Sanchez has uh, uh, asked for that, plus uh, asked for a hearing on the merits, is that we accord her her request and uh, uh, postpone a uh, uh, disposition on the motion to dismiss until we have a hearing on the merits, as she requested in her letter on February 12, 1997 which was subsequent to the filing of Mr. Dornan's opposition on February 10th. Uh, thank you. Uh, is there any further comment you wish to offer at this point? Not at this time, sir, no. Thank you very much. And Mr. Hoyer, as I said, uh, you're I welcome Mr. Ballantyne to, to be seated at the table if he wishes. The uh, suggestion of the council, and frankly my suggestion as well, is that we honor the request of Ms. Sanchez and um, I would be happy to entertain a motion to that effect. Before hearing from Mr. Valentine? Uh, if you wish to have him comment on the recommendation. Uh, uh, I, I would so like briefly. to have him. I think, I think it's a fairly straightforward issue, but uh, proceed as long as, you know, if we're just discussing that. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Unfortunately, in my view, that's, it's not a straightforward issue, uh, and I would uh, respectfully take issue with one thing that Mr. Schweitzer said, which is the critical point he made. Uh, the statute at Section 383D, uh, in fact, does reference postponement of the disposition of a motion to dismiss uh, until the hearing on the merits. Uh, however, the hearing on the merits contemplated by the statute is not the same as an evidentiary hearing, which is what is contemplated in Ms. Sanchez's letter. Uh, quite to the contrary, what the statute refers to as a hearing on the merits refers to what the statute uh, refers to at the end of the statute in the final resolution of a matter under the FCEA uh, is a matter that will be disposed of before this committee on the record on the merits. Um, so we're talking about two different types of hearing here, and that reference in the statute uh, does not contemplate and does not intend to confuse a hearing on the merits with an evidentiary hearing. The hearing in California uh, is not a hearing on the merits, and deferral of the motion to dismiss to that point is not as what's contemplated in the statute. I, I might clarify the intent of the chair. As, uh, as I had discussed with Mr. Hoyer earlier, I felt it was essential to, uh, to have the hearing uh, in California regardless. But I would certainly not contemplate uh, taking further action without the type of hearing you mentioned as well. I will also ask Mr. Schweitzer for his oh, response. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, as I stated, the statute contemplates uh, a hearing on the merit. The statute contemplates a postponement of the decision. She's requested that, and I'm 
I, my recommendation to you is to accord her her request and go forward with uh, what you have already suggested. Mr. Chairman? Um, yes, uh, uh, Mr. Nay. I have a motion resolved that the task force will postpone the uh, disposition of the contestee's motion to dismiss until a hearing on the merits will be held. Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the, the question before the committee is the motion by Mr. Nay. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland. Yeah. C could I ask counsel? Uh, yes. Mr. Schweitzer. Yes, sir. Uh, when was the last hearing on the merits of a case like this? Um, we have not had a hearing on the merits uh, in a case like this. In uh, history? Uh, I'm not aware of any. Never history. in history have no, we sir. gotten to this point. Uh, do you believe that the pleadings as they uh, now stand uh, meet either the Rose or Tunnel standard? Uh, I think uh, when you have the allegations of fraud and you have in, in uh, the Mr. Dornan's opposition, uh, a claim that uh, there were 1,789 instances of either actual or apparent illegal voting occurred. I would say that that plus a hearing to find out what, what uh, may have occurred, and you've got two uh, uh, investigations going on uh, with uh, the uh, local uh, authorities, uh, I think that it has met that standard, yes, sir. But the go, proceed. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask for clarification on the point, but uh, oh, let me. On I, that I, point? Th I thought you were finished. Proceed. I was not. Uh, Mr. Schweitzer, you indicate that he makes the claim. Yes, sir. Every contestant makes the claim. Mm -hmm. Everyone. The reason none of them have ever gotten by the motion to dismiss or dismiss themselves, as happened in the Gadison case, is because of the next standard that they had credible evidence to support their claim. Now, do you believe that Mr. Dornan, in his, pre in his pleading, in his, in his original claim, or uh, in any way enhanced by his further pleading, has presented credible evidence? And if so, what is that evidence? Um, he, uh, in my opinion, that he, ha he has uh, He's made an allegation. You and I agree on that. The statute requires much more than that, and the precedents clearly require more than that. Am I correct? Yes, sir. All right, sir. Mm -hmm. What is the credible evidence that Mr. Dornan has uh, presented this committee with? Mr. Dornan has, has uh, listed, and I can go, if you'd like me to go through this. No, I know what he's listed in terms of his allegations. And he has submitted an appendix, an evidentiary appendix that he filed with his opposition uh, in which he uh, listed the claims that 1,789 instances of either actual or apparent illegal voting occurred. And there are two investigations ongoing uh, in California at the present time which are investigating fraudulent voting. That in my mind is, is and Mr. Mr. Uh, Dornan uh, will make a presentation at an evidentiary hearing in order to uh, further his, uh, his claims. Of course, that's, I understand that's, that, that's markedly, excuse me, may I finish? Sure. That, that's, that, is, that is different than other matters that we have had before these, uh, this committee, in my experience. Uh, are you, are you different in the sense that, are, do you, that, that clearly, you have, every, you have, case, every case that, that I know anything about, the contestant has claimed fraud or irregularities or mistake, all of which would have affected the votes. Uh, we, we agree on that. That, that has been the, the gravamen of the contestants. I, I, the, only, the only place I would disagree with you, sir, is that in, in, uh, uh, in many of the, the contested elections that I'm aware of, and I've been doing this for about 20 years, the, the claim of fraud was not, uh, was not in uh, many of them. You had contested of irregularities, but not necessarily fraud. Well, without trying to quibble about that, uh, that's one of the standards, obviously, and that's one of the things that has, I think, has been claimed in some of the cases. But that notwithstanding, what I'm concerned about is uh, it was one of the things that we're giving great deference to Mrs. Sanchez, uh, Congresswoman Sanchez today, 
Uh, I hope we continue that. But uh, having sure said that, one of the things that she asked in her motion was at least for a more definite statement as to what, in fact, Mr. Dornan is alleging. Not just claiming, but alleging are credible evidences, affidavits, uh, uh, statement of persons, uh, findings, uh, uh, paper uh, uh, writings, uh, whatever. And I don't find that in the large document or in the pleading. Now, uh, are we, are we, you have not mentioned the, her request, her alternative request for a more definite statement. And my recommendation would be to, to do what she asked for, which is to, uh, which is contemplated by the statute, which is to uh, postpone a hearing on the motion to dismiss. She pled it in the alternative, postpone a hearing on the motion to dismiss, and as a result of that, have it until the hearing on the merits. No, That's no, what I do. Counsel, I don't want to quibble with you. She didn't plead this. She, she, ended, she included that in the letter. What she pled was a motion to dismiss or in the alternative a more definite statement. That's what she pled. Well, if, uh, I, if, I said, if I said pled, I I, I, I know what you that. meant. I'm she sorry. I meant that she requested she that in the letter. She requested. Yes, and sir. And I, I want to say uh, to counsel and the committee, I think uh, Mrs. Sanchez obviously wants to be very open with the voters of the 46th District, with the voters of this country. Uh, but I want to say uh, very frankly that we ought to consider the precedent because every future contested election, if I were contesting the election, I would say, well, I understand that I don't have a whole lot of evidence, but you know, in 1997, Mrs. Sanchez in the Sanchez-Dornan case, she said, come out and have a hearing. Well, opponent, why don't you do that? Don't you want people to know? Now, the problem with that is it subjects an incumbent to exactly what the law and the precedents don't want to subject an incumbent to or to the people of the 46th District or any other district of America. That is a fishing expedition, which is why, counsel, I suggest to you that credible evidence, both in the new standard case, the Anderson-Rose standard that I, am, am I correct that that's the standard that we are operating on? Well, you have that in the, in the Gadenson standard as well, yes, sir? Okay. Uh, but the Gadenson case, of course, was dismissed by the contestant. Yes, sir. So that ultimately the disposition was that the contestant gave up. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, in the Rose case, of course, the motion to dismiss was granted. Yes, sir. So the standard, presumably, that was, that was articulated in the Rose case the Anderson case, is the standard, am I correct, that we ought to judge Mr. Dornan's pleading by? Yes, sir. Not the Tunno case. What, am, I, am I correct what, what, that it's your view that the Tunno standard and the uh, Rose standard are different standards? No, my view is that they are the same. That, that, the, that, the, that it never changed uh, what, what occurred uh, in the... Uh, in the, in the contested elections that, that occurred subsequent to 1994, that it didn't change. It simply, we simply went beyond where we had gone in the past, which is that we never got beyond simply a, a consideration of a motion to dismiss and didn't do anything further than that. And, and all, all that occurred in those subsequent elections was that uh, we went further and looked, into, and looked into them and gave somebody an opportunity the contestant an opportunity to present something other than simply uh, deciding it on a raw motion to dismiss. Yes, sir. That's that, but, but I wouldn't say that the standard has changed. Did Mr. Ballantyne, oh, uh, you wanted to comment. I'm sorry, Mr. Well, uh, Mr. Mayor, I just want to point out I'm trying to be fair and, and let you have plenty of time, but uh, I don't want it to drag on forever either. So I, uh, I will two very to, I'll be happy to have you recognize your, or I'm sorry, I will recognize your counsel. <laughs> And, uh, and entertain his response, and then I have comments to make. Uh, yes. Th thank you, Mr. No, Chairman. Uh, I wanted to make two points in response to uh, what Mr. Schweitzer said. The case before the committee now is not terribly different in any sense than many cases that have come before this committee before, even as recent as the Rose case. And in fact, in the Rose case, 
Uh, we can quibble about the uh, semantics of the term fraud, but in the Rose case, you had allegations of poll workers opening up ballot boxes after the close of the polls. Absolutely. You had allegations of bribery. Uh, you had uh, very serious allegations of misconduct in the Rose case. And, and in fact, uh, of course, the committee found it appropriate in that case, pursuant to the very high standard and the very high burden that the contestant must bear to dismiss that case. The second point I would make uh, is while certainly uh, in his pleading, Mr. Dornan makes a claim of some 1,785 votes that he alleges illegal, uh, if a cl close look at the pleadings uh, indicates that, in fact, he backs down off that number. But we don't even need to entertain that, because even if that number were true, that number is clearly, as a simple matter of arithmetic, not nearly enough for him to get over the burden and overcome the 979 vote margin because the remedy that this committee has always applied to potentially illegal and improper votes is a proportional reduction of those votes pursuant to the percentages that each candidate received. So even if, and it is not justified at all in my view by the evidence put forth by Mr. Dornan, but even if you did accept that number and applied uh, really the unquestioned standard that this committee has always applied to that number, uh, you do not get anywhere near Mr. Dornan being able to allege a necessary uh, margin increase, and, and that is why it is certainly my view that on the four corners of the pleadings before this committee today, there is simply no question that law and precedence uh, mandates that this committee grant this motion <coughs> to dismiss today and that this proceeding go no further. Well, thank you for your comments. I, I would respectfully disagree. I believe that uh, there is certainly sufficient evidence that there is a possibility and we owe it to the public and to the contestant, <coughs> contestant to, uh, to review in detail the allegations. I would also point out, and I have not served on this committee as long as, as Mr. Hoyer, uh, but uh, in the previous two years, I participated in one field hearing. We had two others. We had one in Connecticut, one in California. In all three cases after the evidentiary hearing, uh, which I, I thought dealt with more than evidence. It also dealt with the merits. And so I'm, I'm, it's not at all clear to me as a non-attorney that there's that much difference because we did, in fact, during the evidentiary hearing, so-called, we did deal with the merits of the case as well. And in the case I was on in North Carolina, you could call that an evidentiary hearing. But based on that, we uh, held a meeting afterwards and, and dismissed the case. Uh, so clearly, we were evaluating the merits at the same time. So I, I think it's not easy to make that distinction. But the point is simply that there are very serious allegations of, of illegal voting in California. We owe it to the voters, as I said, to examine that fact, uh, in particular in view of some of the charges that have been publicized, not just by Mr. Dornan, but by the media, by the district attorney, by the secretary of state, about alleged illegal activities of uh, an organization which was deliberately trying to, to uh, register individuals to vote, which is certainly an admirable pursuit. But if, in fact, they did, as is alleged, registered non-citizens to vote, <coughs> that's an illegal activity and something that should be investigated to determine the impact of that on the election. So it seems to me that the issue here is very simple. We have to get more information. The way to get more information is to conduct a hearing. I had proposed that to uh, Mr. Hoyer before I even received Ms. Sanchez's letter. I that I, this is something I thought we should do. Uh, her letter reinforced my belief that that was the next proper step to take. And I uh, strongly encourage the committee to approve the motion that Mr. Ney has made. And that is simply that we proceed to conduct a public hearing and uh, uh, accede to Ms. Sanchez's question, request to postpone for the time being the motion to dismiss. Mr. Is there Chairman, any further discussion on that motion? I would like to offer an amendment. The gentleman from Maryland would like to offer an amendment. I would, move, I would move uh, to amend the uh, uh, motion by uh, adding that uh, uh, the committee also uh, approves Mrs. Sanchez's request that the contestant be required to provide a more definite statement of his claim. So that when we have, and that's my motion, my amendment. And in support of that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to say that what that will do uh, is that it will focus us more particularly at the time we have the hearing on the specific allegations 
that Mr. Dornan is making with respect to why he believes he was the winner and Mrs. Sanchez was not, which is, as I understand it, the standard under the statute that must be met for this committee to, uh, to act. It seems to me that is a reasonable uh, request uh, to add. It does not eliminate uh, Mr. the, the uh, uh, other parts of Mr. Ney's motion, uh, but it does give to the committee um, what I think it needs to more uh, adequately consider this matter. And to, to put, uh, which is the purpose of pleading, while I understand this is not a legal proceeding, uh, the, the, all of our predecessors have been pretty careful in trying to make sure that legal process was accorded to contestee as well as contestant. It would give to Mrs. Uh, to Congresswoman Sanchez a better opportunity to more specifically respond uh, to what I think is a very general, as I have stated, uh, allegation. I mean, it, it does make claims. Mr. Chairman, for instance, you in your uh, comments say that the media investigations raise the possibility. I would suggest to you most respectfully there is a possibility in 435 districts in America that something went wrong, even in uncontested elections. But that's not the standard we're looking for. Uh, we're looking for credible evidence that, in fact, they affected the election. <coughs> and the result would have been different but for those actions. I would hope, uh, I am very cognizant of the fact that this is a committee made up of two Republicans, one Democrat, <laughs> and that uh, I can't carry it without one of you. But I would think that you would think that was a fair thing to do so that the contestant in this case would have to come forward with a more particular statement of specifically what he alleges, not what could have happened, but what he says did happen. In fact, of course, if we're talking about what's happening in California, the, sec the uh, registrar, in responding to Mr. Dornan, uh, was relatively dismissive of his claims and pointed out numerous errors made in his claim. And the Secretary of State, of course, certified the election subsequent to the claims being made. So I would hope that we could, we could at least require that. Well, the motion is before us. I would simply comment that um, it, it's certainly more than remote possibility in this case. Uh, I don't want my words misinterpreted. Uh, Mr. Dornan has alleged a sufficient number of votes to change the result of the election. I believe that exam uh, requires a close examination. I would also point out that the motion before us, not the amendment, but the motion without the amendment, does not reject the request for more definite statement. That is an alternate uh, request or alternate motion to the motion to dismiss. We are simply postponing both of those and it would still be uh, appropriate for the committee at some later date to consider whether a more definite statement is needed. In view of the fact that Mr. Dornan submitted a much a larger amount of information after his initial contest, notice of contents, and you have seen the, uh, the, the majority council uh, waiving that. There's considerable amount of evidence there. I think that satisfies the immediate need for a more definite statement. It may well be that after we conduct the hearing that this committee might decide to honor the alternate motion and ask for a more definite statement from Mr. Dorn at that time. That would certainly be a possibility. We are not rejecting that possibility with the motion that Mr. Ney offered. We are simply saying we want to postpone that action until we have ourselves determined through the course of the public hearing and further uh, committee action whether or not such a more definite sta statement is required in view of the supplementary information that he provided. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ney, do you have any comment on, on the amendment before we proceed to a vote? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just say that I, I think this amendment is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, there are some circumstances here again which uh, I'll reiterate uh, from the Los Angeles Times. There is acknowledgment beyond anything that uh, uh, Mr. Dornan has stated about people who actually voted it, that whom in fact were not citizens. Uh, there are, uh, as I understand it, two separate independent investigations 
of the situation, which you don't normally have uh, uh, investigations that are publicly announced. And, and as far as it's been mentioned twice now about the certificate of election, I would just further recall as far as precedent, we had a situation where this Congress, before I got here, had a chance to seat somebody from Indiana who was the recognized, certified, no matter what allegations were out there of, of voter fraud or misconduct, was recognized and could have been seated. <clears throat> Now, we didn't do those types of things that were done, I think it was in 1984. We respected the Secretary of State. So there, you know, there's no doubt, just to clarify everything, that we in this Congress have respected the Secretary of State, but issues have, have been raised, and I don't think that this precludes additional um, statements from uh, Mr. Dornan or from Ms. Sanchez at the hearing. Uh, but again, what I, I honestly didn't expect any uh, form of controversy on this because we, we do have the letter which, and I quote from uh, Congresswoman Sanchez, states, I will ask you to withhold consideration of my motion. She's asking us and invite the task force to conduct a field hearing in Orange County. So really, I. I you know, this letter, I think, further uh, backs up the motion, and really, I, I just view it as, as the process being fair, the process willing to listen out on the turf where, frankly, we probably should be to hear this. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, sir. Um, if I understand what the chairman is saying, that what we are doing at this juncture is to simply decide to have the field hearing in California and that uh, other <coughs> matters will be postponed until that field hearing is concluded and that the parties will be in the same position that we are not adversely affecting the interest of either party at this time. And Mr. Chairman, you indicated that a motion to dismiss uh, would be uh, further consideration of that motion to dismiss or further consideration of the motion for definite statement would be in order at that time and they are not being disposed of at this point in time. Am I correct that that's what you're saying? Yes, based on the motion that has been made by Mr. Ney, I would like to ask Mr. Ney to repeat the motion and ask Mr. Schweitzer to comment on, on the precise wording uh, because I believe that is the intent of the motion as offered. It, well, I, I actually, I was, I was saying to you, Mr. Chairman, but I, I asked him to yield for the question. And I guess that I want to know the consequences of what we're doing. Can I ask one question? Yes, Mr. Ney. Uh, you had uh, stated this would preclude other proceedings. Could I ask for a clarification of what you would feel would be other proceedings? I just want to make sure I answer well, accurately. You can control the time. You're asking Mr. Yes, Hines. I'm asking Mr. You can yield the time to him, Mr. Hines. I, I think I said a did I say preclude other proceedings? I can't remember the exact wording. Uh, if I said that, I, I or, don't know the context well, in which I said it. But let me restate it so you okay. know what I'm saying uh, very clearly. I am concerned uh, that we leave the parties where they are at this point in time. And from what I heard the chairman say, that's what we're doing. All we are doing is deciding at this point in time to defer pending a field hearing. Not a hearing on the merits, the field hearing. And that subsequent to that field hearing, the motion to dismiss might still be in order. The motion for a definite statement might still be in order. And if that's what we're doing, then I would, my, my chairman, I think is correct that I, I will I'll withdraw my, my amendment if that's what we're doing. I would, that's uh, what I was told we were doing. Thank you. I'll repeat. I'll ask but Mr. Nade to read the motion. Hard to follow. The task force will postpone the def, um, disposition of the contestee's motion to dismiss until a hearing on the merits is held. And that, that motion was not the original motion. Yes. Yes, if you, I think if Well, then if that's the original motion, that's different than what Mr. Chairman you said and what I just said. Because once you have the hearing on the on the merits, neither the motion to dismiss nor the motion for more definite statement are going to be in order. And counsel, I'm sure that am I correct in that? No, sir. Mr. What, Schweitzer. What what uh, the statute the statutes uh, clear. Statute says if the mo uh, statute says if the committee denies the motion or postpones its disposition until the hearing on the merits. 
post we're postponing our disposition on the hearing on the merits. Then the statute is clear what follows after that. Counsel, let me ask you a question. Sure. And we'll get to it. Mr. Hoyer. Would I was told, and Mr. Chairman, I, I, I want to be fair, and I'm going to be prepared to be fair, but we are changing Mrs. Sanchez's status. We are changing her status, and counsel, you ought to know it. Mr. Dornan is on a fishing expedition in California. And if we pass this motion, you are sanctioning that. If we pass this motion, Mrs. Sanchez nor her counsel will have any ability to say he is untimely because an answer hasn't been filed. Because if you delay, clearly a hearing on the merits, and the motion to dismiss, and the motion for a more definite statement, then you will not give Mrs. Sanchez any more information that she seeks. And you will say to Mr. Dornan, you're free to go. I don't think that's fair. And not only that, Mr. Chairman, I want to tell you, that's not what I was told was going to happen. Well, Mr. And I Mr. believe that if we're going to have those discussions, uh, I want to be fair. I want to be open. I'm prepared to sit and do whatever we're going to do. But I don't think that I have been dealt with fairly at this point in time, nor do I believe Mrs. Sanchez is, and I think she has been substantially uh, treated in a detrimental fashion by the specific wording of the motion, and I do not believe that the specific wording of that motion was by mistake. May I the, respond? Uh, thank the gentleman from Maryland. I, I believe you are certainly misinformed on our intent and the results of the motion. The motion before us, it's very straightforward and that is to postpone action on the motion before us and uh, that we will conduct this hearing. Uh, That's not you, what the you, motion says. Well, Mr. It, Chairman, with all due respect, it says something specifically that was drafted not, I respectfully suggest, uh, by happenstance. It will have a specific ramification, and I believe, counsel, am I correct in my assertion that there will be no longer any standing in terms of an objection to the timeliness of the filing. Let me ask you, Mr. Ballantyne, for your view as to what the result of this action will be as it relates to the issue of uh, discovery at this time. Mr. Uh, Ballantyne, thank you, Mr. you're Chairman. recognized for a response. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, wording of the motion as it's, as it's worded by postponing to a time uh, for a hearing on the merits triggers in the statute uh, the time frame for the filing of the answer. And by triggering the time frame for the filing of the answer, it will then trigger the time frame for the parties to undertake discovery. It's my understanding that has never happened in an FCEA case before. If the intention of Congressman Ney's motion is merely to de delay the uh, disposition of the motion to dismiss until more information is gathered in a field hearing, I would just respectfully suggest that the, the language of the amendment could be changed to take the term out hearing on the merits and call it hearing for further evidence. Uh, you can call it almost anything, but calling it hearing on the merits does trigger both discovery and the time for filing of an answer and therefore vitiating the motion to dismiss under the statute. And I, I don't know what that was the intent, but it's very well, easily fixed. Let me, let me respond question, to that. Mr. Schweitzer. It does, it does not vitiate the motion uh, to dismiss. It's, it's perfectly contemplated by the statute. She, uh, she answers. I mean, that's, that is a, that she answers and then the statute is clear what follows subsequent to that. And uh, that still, that she, she then, all she of her when? arguments, all of her arguments, in, she answers the notice of contest. All of her arguments in the motion to dismiss Prior to the are hearing. still pending. Prior yeah, to the hearing. Pending. Just, just Absolutely. a moment. Absolutely. Yes, sir. The, uh, <laughs> there's <laughs> definite timelines laid out in the statute as to when things will occur. Correct. And uh, that. I, I don't see that the motion and the wording of the motion affects that at all. The motion is very straightforward and the intent is very straightforward. The question before us is the Hoyer amendment to that motion. I believe we've had ample discussion on the motion and we're starting to stray away from the, uh, the intent here. I will call for the vote on the amendment. On the amendment, Mr. Ney? Yes. The amendment. Oh, and Mr. Chairman, I move the amendment. Uh, no, the movement's move. We need the vote. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we need the vote on the amendment. It's two to one, Mr. Chairman. I won. <laughs> Thank you. On the, on the I don't believe it will be sustained, and I'm going to file a contesting uh, because the there's been a change in vote which changed the outcome. 
The gentleman is out of order. <laughs> the amendment before us is the Hoyer Amendment, <laughs> which you have all heard. Mi Mr. Nay, on the Hoyer Amendment. I'm uh, sorry. On the Hoyer. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I thought you meant on my amendment. I was kind of shocked when uh, it was expected a no on my amendment. <laughs> on the Hoyer Amendment, I'm a no, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hoyer on the Hoyer Amendment. Mr. Hoyer, do you wish to vote on your amendment? I'll vote aye on my amendment along with Mr. Nay. <laughs> and, <I w> <laughs> yeah. and on the Hoyer Amendment, the chair votes no. The amendment is defeated. The question before us now is the Nay Amendment as originally offered. And can we read Once that one more time so I will understand it and have it specifically? Yes. On the Nay motion, Mr. The Chairman, Nay motion will Mr. Resolved, Nay will the motion. task force will postpone the disp uh, disposition of the contestee's motion to dismiss until a hearing on the merits. I mean, yes. Can the we, motion is before us. another amendment? If, if, it's, Why not? Uh, if it's not dilatory or if I, it's, if won't it's, even if it's it. to the point. Mr. Chairman, you have repeatedly said that we're going to have a field hearing. Uh, I presume at some point in time we'll have a hearing here on the merits with counsel present, uh, with the uh, uh, pleadings uh, in order, uh, and with the intent of this committee to dispose of uh, the case. I would, th and, and you've referred to this as a field hearing. Can we call this until a field hearing is held? I don't see that it makes any difference. It makes a difference under the statute, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I fail to see. Uh, if you wish to defend your statement that it has an impact, you if, may do if, so. Mr. Chairman, uh, let me, yeah, I'll defend it. I want the parties in the same position they are today, uh, tomorrow. I think if you pass the motion as you're s stating it originally without the amendment, I think their positions have changed. I'm not sure that they haven't changed with field hearing, but you have referred to that as a field hearing, and I understand what you're saying. As a matter of fact, you said that the Rose hearing was really, uh, you weren't sure a hearing on the merits. As I understand a hearing on the merits, both parties are present. They present evidence. They call witnesses. And we dispose of a case, take it under advisement, dispose of it at some point in time in the future. A field hearing, I perceive as something different than that. Now, are we contemplating that this case is going to be argued in California? Or is it going to be argued here in the capital of the United States? Because if what we're doing is a field hearing, so we, we don't, uh, we, we, you know, we hear the California people and we hear uh, those folks that want to come forward, then it is a field hearing. I presume at some point in time, Mr. Chairman, we're going to actually have the case heard here, however, and disposed of here with counsel for the contestee and counsel for the contestant arguing their cases, presenting evidence, and closing. Am I correct on that or not? We haven't discussed this, so I don't know, but I think it Mr. makes Mr. Hoyer, all I can point out is, is that uh, in the conduct of the Rose case, we did conduct a field hearing. Right. Both counsels were present. Evidence was presented. Some arguments were presented. We then returned to, to this capital. We held a further meeting, not a hearing, at which we dismissed the, the case. Uh, the point, I, I believe your motion is out of order, and I will rule that it's out of order. Uh, I, we've had I? more than ample discussion on this, and I believe it is time to uh, bring it to a vote. The vote is... Mr. Nay's vote on that question, Mr. Nay? Yes. Mr. Nay votes yes. Mr. Hoyer? No. Mr. Hoyer votes no. The chair votes yes. The Nay motion is adopted. I would also like to announce I've uh, consulted the calendars and the possible dates for, fielding, for hearing to be held uh, in the 46th district. And Mr. Hoyer, um, if I may have your attention, I would certainly like to work with you on, on choosing an appropriate date, but the dates available are limited. It's, I'm very anxious to carry this forward as quickly as possible within the time constraints we have in our schedule and the time it would take to set up a hearing. Uh, it appears to me the, the best possible time would be April 19th, which is the weekend, uh, is a very long weekend for us because of the Passover holiday. And that gives us uh, an opportunity. The advantage of the 19th is that it is a Saturday. I believe it's preferable for the people of that district to have a hearing on a Saturday uh, when, many, when they will, in all likelihood, not have to work and will be able to attend. 
An alternative would be to have it on April 18th to Friday, rather late in the day because of the time it would take us to fly out there. Or uh, the next option would be the May the 5th, which is a Monday. And uh, it's certainly a possibility, but it has a difficulty that we have to catch a red eye back afterwards in order to ha since we have votes the very next day. Uh, you can take your time, if you wish, in deciding between those three, di three dates, but I did want to give you some option if for any reason uh, one of those is better than the other. But my, my desire and my recommendation is to have the hearing on the 19th. Having no further Mr. business. Chairman. Yes. Do you have an immediate response to the, to the suggested dates? I, I don't have an immediate response. I thank you for giving me three alternatives. I will be back to you by tomorrow uh, with uh, uh, the date that, is, uh, that is, is possible or preferable or maybe both. Yeah. Uh, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Ballantyne, if I might, before we close. Uh, Mr. Ballantyne, uh, have, have you prepared uh, anything uh, for this hearing, for the, the issue on the on the motion? I don't think that's appropriate at this point. We have completed our discussion of the agenda, and uh, if there are any further issues to be presented, you can present them to me or to the task force later. Uh, we will also have opportunity at the hearing to present any further information. But we've already spent a considerable amount of time on this subject today, and I would uh, declare the meeting adjourned.